Nice to see you here. I have just finished uh, my uh, discussions with the heads of state uh, and government. Uh, the main message that I have conveyed on behalf of the European Parliament is that we need to continue to support uh, Ukraine to defend itself. We need to continue to show uh, solidarity and avoid uh, any sign of uh, fatigue. In this regard, the ammunition deal reached by member states earlier this week represents a landmark uh, moment for the European Union, and I specifically thank the High Representative Borrell for his efforts uh, on this. Europe will always stand for peace, for a real peace with accountability and justice. But for there to be a peace, there needs to be a Ukraine, a free Ukraine. And for there to be a European Union, there must be a free Ukraine. And the price of liberty can never be too high. I also spoke uh, about the need for us to give more visibility to the heavy toll that this aggression is having on Ukraine's people and especially its uh, children. Uh, this brutal and illegal war is ruining the lives uh, of uh, a generation. I also um, mentioned uh, um, uh, the, and referred to the International Criminal, Criminal Court's arrest warrants uh, in the context of uh, Putin and his accomplices at every level needed to be sanctioned and held to account. And it is this momentum that we must build on and one that can work in sync with the need to establish a special international tribunal for the crime uh, of aggression committed against uh, Ukraine. The second uh, theme of our discussion focused on competitiveness uh, and here, uh, I made it very clear that it is particularly important that we as co-legislators work closely together as we need to deliver uh, for our citizens. And I say this with an eye uh, open already on the upcoming uh, EU elections. Our uh, European economies are all car competitive, but our task is to keep them competitive in order to boost our economic output, create jobs and invest in the green and digital transitions. We need to lead on this globally, but uh, we also need to lead on this uh, at home. And in order to get, for us to get there, we need people to buy into the idea that going green will pay off for them, their businesses and their families. And that's why we must make the business case and provide the right incentives for people to come uh, on board. And for this, we need clear uh, direction, public and private investments and legislative predictability. Easing bureaucracy uh, and burden to go green will help. We need a, a level playing field. Uh, this is crucial, but also let's avoid a protectionist race. I in fact, I repeated this point that I made last uh, European um, uh, Council. I also spoke on migration because I, and this is something that also a lot uh, of Prime Ministers uh, and I spoke uh, on bilaterally a uh, couple of words. The Parliament will vote uh, on the asylum and migration files next week. Uh, so our um, message is that we uh, have done and will continue to do our part, also keeping in mind uh, the signature uh, of uh, the roadmap that we signed as Parliament with uh, the five presidencies all the way leading up to the European elections in 2024. But now we also need, uh, and this is a specific ask that I put on the table from the Council and its leaders to deliver on the remaining files linked to solidarity. If we don't move in unison, then we will not be able to go back to our citizens in 2024 and say that we have at least tried to address the multifaceted challenge uh, of uh, uh, migration and then also making sure that all the elements are included in the decisions that we take. So I'll stop here and happy to take uh, any questions. Oui, bonjour, Madame Metzola. Christian Spiman de l'AFP en français. Madame Metzola. J'y vais? Okay. Oui. Um, <laughs> vous avez insisté sur uh, la rapidité, l'urgence d'agir rapidement pour aider l'Ukraine. Le Parlement européen a bloqué depuis quelques mois un instrument que tout le monde attend pour lancer la productivité et faire refaire les stocks de munitions. Et en fait, on voit que toute la gestion de l'Ukraine est faite au travers de fonds, d'instruments qui échappent complètement aux communautaires. 
La facilité européenne pour la paix est intergouvernementale. C'est elle qui est utilisée pour acheminer les armes, pour les acheter, pour les livrer. C'est elle qui répond aux besoins de l'Ukraine. Et on a un peu l'impression que le Parlement européen s'est fait mettre sur la touche. Les auditeurs ont alerté, justement, la Cour des comptes a alerté sur la multiplication des instruments qui montraient que l'Union européenne, aujourd'hui, est en train de basculer du communautaire vers l'intergouvernemental, et ce, avec la bénédiction des États membres. Est-ce que vous allez accepter longtemps d'être mis sur la touche et de rester sur la touche. Merci. OK, merci um, pour uh, votre question. Uh, pour le Parlement européen, c'est clair depuis um, le premier jour de la guerre que um, on était um, à côté de l'Ukraine uh, en face de cette invasion uh, illégale et brutale. Pourquoi je commence par ça? Parce que ça, c'est le fond sur lequel nous prenons, nous avons pris toutes les décisions. Sur l'assistance microfinancière, le Parlement européen a immédiatement pris les décisions pour aider l'Ukraine, mais aussi la Moldavie. On a pris des décisions avec la procédure d'urgence, mais on a pris aussi la décision pas avec la procédure d'urgence. On était prêts en dedans nos commissions responsables de faire Comment, we, comment on peut dire, les processus qui sont peut-être un, peu un, un peu plus efficaces qu'on qu fait d'habitude. Um, pour nous, c'était important et pour moi, c'est important d'avoir un Parlement me, qui peut indeed, uh, répondre aux demandes des citoyens, mais aussi des pays qui ont besoin de nous. Uh, et on peut parler de tous les moyens, on peut parler aussi du fait qu'on a vu uh, peut-être un peu trop l'utilisation de l'article 122. Uh, mais depuis que le Parlement a dit qu'on peut um, travailler dans un moyen efficace, uh, l'utilisation de cet article, on ne voit pas. The, nous avons uh, l'espérance, le, nous espérons que uh, pendant la prochaine année, uh, on peut uh, se mettre um, uh, en retournant en plein forme d'être le co-législateur. Et sur ça, dans tous les moyens, to dans toutes les compétences uh, qu'on a le Parlement, mais aussi pour être sûr que les citoyens the sont inclus dans les décisions qui sont... Uh, qui, 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 qui um, leur touchent. Uh, uh, aussi qu'on prend prend les décisions um, uh, sur l'aide de l'Ukraine. Et surtout les décisions faites en relation à l'Ukraine. Le Président, vous avez écrit une lettre à la Suédoise présidente sur les émissions de CO2. Pouvez-vous nous expliquer un peu pourquoi vous avez écrit cette lettre et pouvez-vous peut-être répondre à certains pays spécifiques spécifiquement avec cette lettre Thank you very much. Uh, yes, I uh, was mandated after a very Uh, open uh, discussion last week in Strasbourg among the Conference of Presidents, which is the group leaders, uh, to write a letter to the presidency in office and therefore Prime Minister uh, Christerson uh, on the need for legislative predictability. Why do we mention the word pre pre legislative predictability? In response to your question, this is not specifically directed uh, um, at uh, one country or another or one legislative file. Or another, uh, it is uh, about the last year of this already very difficult legislative mandate where we have laws that have been negotiated between two co-legislators, legislation sometimes that has been on the table for almost uh, two years uh, and subsequently approved with uh, Um, significant majorities uh, in the hemicycle in this particular case that I wrote uh, in, uh, in February. So our point as a parliament is primarily institutional and procedural that we cannot uh, go back uh, on uh, deals because this is ultimately about trust between uh, co-legislators and the credibility of the legislative process, which if you link to the answer I gave to the previous question is specifically also about this. Uh, if we are asked or tasked by our citizens to legislate in a specific area, to take decisions in a specific area, we need to be prepared to do that. And once we do that, then we need to deliver.
Thank you so much. Parzan Hassan, reporter from Kurdistan 24. Before your European election 2024, do you think a possible agreement on immigration package? Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, next week we will vote uh, on uh, the migration, the asylum and migration um, regulation file, the um, uh, qualifications file and screening. Um, it's, you, if you think about the package, there are many different individual legislative proposals, some which are in the security part of the pact and some which are in the asylum part of the pact. What we wanted, and this is um, a consistent position of the Parliament, is that when we are going to deliver uh, on a legislative package on migration, then it is one that has to be fair with uh, who asks uh, for uh, protection, which is uh, firm with those who are not eligible and which is strong with uh, traffickers and violators of human rights who prey on the most vulnerable people on our planet. We came into this legislature with that um, demand from our citizens. Last legislature was disappointing. We had arrived to this point. We voted in the, in the plenary, very difficult files on solidarity, on security but it took us years and some are still waiting for a decision. What has our position been as well? This is an area where majority voting takes place in the council. It is not an area with unanimity and therefore if we can find majorities, we need the courage to have the general approach, again another technical term that is used uh, in, this, uh, in this council during this presidency uh, in order for us to be ready by 2024 with, with legislation. Will, th will this address all the challenges? I would never say that, but what I do not want is the automatic return of every government to a national position that is completely different from the neighbouring position. Uh, the European Union has shown throughout this mandate that it can act uh, in unison, it can act when united, uh, as it did on the pandemic, as we have been doing during the war. On migration, this is one of the areas where the citizens have been asking us, pleading with us for years to do that, and I think it's about time that we did it. Shandor from Euronews, it's not related to the summit, but we understand that the European Parliament is preparing to join the court case in Luxembourg against Hungary's child protection law. Can you tell us why is it important for, for, for the European Parliament? What do you expect and what's your personal position on this? Thank you. Thank you. Yes, uh, there was uh, a decision taken in the Legal Affairs Committee, uh, which is the process that we have when the European Parliament takes a decision as to whether it will intervene before the Court of Justice uh, in defence uh, uh, of an EU uh, regulation or directive, basically a legislative act. In this case, the vote took place and therefore I was asked uh, to task the legal service um, uh, to prepare such intervention and I have done that. Hatmi Sakari from Malayan News Agency. Uh, my question is in French if it doesn't uh, mic. Uh, looking at the social economic and social and political situation in Tunisia, obviously uh, migration is part of that. Um, votre, votre voisin, votre cher voisin, Tunisien a besoin justement d'aide économique et sociale pour éviter justement l'augmentation et la complication de la situation de la migration. Est-ce que vous avez envisagé ou bien est-ce que vous avez des programmes pour ce pays qui, qui a vraiment besoin d'aide de, de, de voisins européens pour régler la situation en termes de migration Merci. Thank you very much uh, um, for this. Uh, a question. First of all, preserving representative institutions uh, is fundamental to Tunisia's development. We are uh, deeply uh, concerned about uh, the authoritarian drift in that country and the instrument instrumentalization of, of Tunisia's uh, dire socio-economic situation uh, to reverse the country's historical democratic uh, transition. Uh, the Parliament uh, has long called for an end to the ongoing crackdown on civil society and we also urge the Vice President uh, of the Commission, the High Representative and the Member States to publicly denounce the, the deterioration of the human rights uh, situation. With regards uh, to the partnership, as you are right, this is a neighbouring country, a very important country for uh, the European uh, Union. Um, uh, we need to look at how uh, helpful specific EU support programs 
uh, have been, and they have been. I have witnessed them myself uh, as a member of the European Parliament on, on, on missions to that uh, uh, country, uh, and also with an understanding that there has to be um, uh, uh, the respect, the fullest of respect of human rights uh, and any uh, discourse uh, with regards, for example, to sub-Saharan migrants and subsequent attacks are in full breach of international uh, and national laws, actually notably uh, Law 50 2018 against racial discrimination. So uh, it is a difficult situation. The Parliament has been quite vocal on this and it is with the, our interest uh, in order to preserve uh, democracy around the Mediterranean and have a constant uh, uh, discourse with our inter interlocutors uh, also on the southern part of the Mediterranean. This has been something that is also close uh, uh, to, to, to my heart and it is something that I think we need to work on much more in the future. Hello, President Metzola, Jorge Liborero, Euronews. I would like to go back to the issue of the combustion engine and ask you clearly about Germany's attitude because many people in this city have been taken by surprise by this last minute opposition to the law. Do you think Germany's attitude is setting a very dangerous precedent when it comes to interinstitutional negotiations? Do you think the spirit of the trilogues is being diminished by this last-minute opposition? Can we still trust the results of trilogues from now on, especially when it comes to the Green Deal? Thank you. As a lawyer, I will say I will always trust in trilogues. Uh, and I say that because when you arrive at a trialogue, it's, uh, it would be the result or the culmination of years uh, of uh, negotiation from the very moment that a commission proposal starts to be even thought of to when it arrives to the co-legislator's desk after loads of negotiations coming together to find a solution. I, look, the Green Deal is, uh, let's say, a fundamental pillar of our mandate. Uh, and what I would say, uh, and I will repeat in part what I answered earlier, is that anything that will seek to diminish or deter from the legislative predictability that we need, not as a, only as a parliament, but as a European Union and as a co-legislator, is something we will always caution against. This is why uh, the letter was sent, and I can tell you that if this had to happen again, this letter will be sent again, but I would hope that it doesn't need to come to that. Thank you.